Um, good morning, colleagues, and welcome to the seventh meeting in 2017 of the Finance and Constitution Committee. Uh, we have apologies from James Kelly this morning. Uh, the first item on our agenda is to continue our consideration of the Air Departure Tax Scotland Bill at Stage 1. By taking evidence from Revenue Scotland, I welcome to the meeting Elaine Mortimer, who is the Chief Executive, Neil Ferguson, who is the Head of Strategy and Change. Um, and I invite um, Elaine to make a short statement if she wishes. Y yes, if I may, convener. And good morning, everybody. And uh, thank you very much, convener and committee members, for inviting us to your meeting today. Uh, Neil Ferguson, um, uh, who is sitting next to me, is the programme manager to implement air departure tax in Revenue Scotland. And together, we hope we can provide some insight and indeed some assurance as to the work that Revenue Scotland is undertaking to ensure a smooth transition to its introduction in Scotland. As the committee is aware, our role is not policy formulation. Uh, that is for the Scottish Government. And our interest, therefore, is primarily in part four of the bill. Revenue Scotland has been operating since 2015 and is the tax authority in Scotland with responsibility for the collection and management of the wholly devolved taxes. An air departure tax is the third tax for which we will assume responsibility, the others being lands and buildings, transaction tax, including the additional dwelling supplement and Scottish landfill tax. The approach that Revenue Scotland takes to its work is grounded in the four principles of taxation set out by Adam Smith certainty, efficiency, convenience, and taxes that are proportionate to the ability to pay. In, in addition, we've taken a digital first approach using technology to best effect, and these principles will underpin our approach to the implementation of your departure tax. Our electronic system for registration and making returns has proved to be secure, reliable and robust, handling around 115,000 tax returns annually with 99.97 per cent reliability. It has the capacity to accommodate your departure tax and our plan is to design a new module which will be added to the existing system. And when we considered the options for administering the new tax, this represented the best value for money and was the most sensible from a risk perspective, offering stability and security. It was clear too from our early engagement with aircraft operators that there was strong support for an online system, particularly given the UK system was paper-based until January this year. In our first two years of operation, we've established a strong reputation for working collaboratively with taxpayers, their agents and representative bodies, as well as other key institutional bodies in the Scottish tax scene, including the Scottish Fiscal Commission and the Scottish Government. And we are grateful for the continued support and sharing of information by HMRC in helping us to prepare for their departure tax, as well as colleagues in Scottish Government and Transport Scotland. And each of these bodies has a seat in our programme board we have established to oversee our work. Air departure tax opens up a new range of taxpayers to our organisation, with many tax operators being global businesses, not domiciled in this jurisdiction. While this may present challenges, we are mindful of, of this as we develop our implementation programme, where we will build on our external engagement with taxpayers through face-to-face -face meetings and dig using digital, digital technology to reach them as best as we can. So, for example, our advice and review group is meeting again in London this week with a number of air um, lines, aircraft operators. The new tax will also bring different challenges with our compliance work. Uh, particularly where enforcement becomes necessary, but these are things we have time to plan for. And we know from other work uh, that engage from our other work that engagement with the taxpayers and their representatives is key to the successful development of our systems, processes, and guidance. And once again, we'll be looking to the aircraft operators to test our systems and assist in the production of our guidance. So, convener, it's, it's relatively early days for our programme of work to bring the new tax into effect. And we would be happy to update the committee at any point in due course as that work progresses. Thanks, Elaine. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Um, the committee has obviously previously heard evidence that the administrative arrangements proposed for the collection of ADT are very similar to the current arrangements for the collection of UK air passenger duty. Um, what would you highlight are the main differences and what improvements do you think you can bring to the, sy to the system and the way you're going to go about it? There are two, as I see it, and Neil will no doubt add some more, but there are two key differences, as I see it, to the administrative arrangements for aircraft operators, convener. The first one is that we'll be moving from requiring them to produce a monthly tax return to a quarterly tax return. 
So, uh, on the face of it, that would be administratively more convenient for the airline operators, and indeed, that's that's the uh, information we've had from them in our work that we have we have done so far with them. Mm -hmm. The second uh, key difference is, of course, that we will be moving to using our online um, tax system for the aircraft operators to use to register with us and also to submit their tax returns. Now, HMRC have just recently, as in January this year, introduced their own digital system, but it's obviously very new. Um, if, if I'd been sitting here in November, I would have been saying that would have been a fundamental change, but obviously they've moved towards a digital system in HMRC, so it's less new for the aircraft operators. But they're the two key differences as I see it. I don't know, Neil, if there's anything else you would want to add. Sure, just <clears throat> there are one or two other minor things, um, I would say that Revenue Scotland will collect the tax, obviously, rather than HMRC. So that's a change for aircraft operators um, in terms of who they're dealing with. Um, we have a requirement to publish the register of uh, taxable persons under Section 13 of the Bill. And the other thing that we're going to be introducing is the opportunity to pay by credit or debit card, um, which is not currently available under UK APD. Um, and is not something that we've done before, um, but we think it would be helpful to particularly occasional operators uh, for the purposes of the tax. So they would be some other key differences. Okay. In your in your submission, you in page three, you, you, you outline the number of processes you handle in regard to LBTT and SFL, SLFT returns. Um, in that, in that regard, is there any estimate available? And maybe it's in the financial memorandum, the policy memorandum. So forgive me if I've missed it. But do you have any estimate yet of the number of actual transactions and returns that you're going to be actually dealing with? on top of what you're already doing as an organisation? Again, Neil will be able to provide um, some detail for you. If we start from the, the number of aircraft operators that we're expecting to deal with, uh, we're expecting to deal with, I think it's 150 uh, aircraft operators who we call, I think, legacy airlines, so the main airlines. And then we're expecting a much smaller number from, <clears throat> excuse me, from occasional operators. So if you set that against... 115,000 tax returns that we receive uh, combining um, landfill tax returns and lands and buildings transaction returns, actually it's going to be a much smaller amount. It will sit somewhere slightly greater than uh, uh, landfill tax, but much less than LBTT. Okay, that's helpful to give an overall perspective. And we've got a range of questions that people want to ask around software issues, the, the change from paper to computers, reporting issues, time issues and some of the complexity. But, but Willie, do you want to kick this off? Thanks very much, convener, and good morning to you. And, uh, my interest in the, the software component stems from a long career in software design and development, so I'm quite keen to understand a wee bit more about where we are in relation to specification and design of the software. Uh, and I note from the financial memorandum that the provision for it is about £120,000, which, which, which some members feel is a wee bit in the modest Side. So, firstly, could you tell us where we are in terms of development of the, the software and the module, and how soon do you think you'll be you'll be able to? You need to require details about the actual operational arrangements for the tax, so that you can build it into the the software. Um, okay. So, I think the starting point in answer to your question is to uh, to to remind the committee that we have an existing system. So, a lot of the sort of fundamental elements, such as the um, the, 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 the main platform for, for, uh, uh, for the management of the tax, uh, how we would expect operators to register, um, the fact that it's uh, web enabled, all that, that's all that functionality already sits there. Um, when we um, developed, um, uh, when we implemented the additional dwelling supplements, we went through a similar process where we had to make amendments to our existing system, and that went through very smoothly. So, for this tax, essentially what we're going to do is develop those bespoke areas purely for this tax, which actually are not that different in many ways from what we have for the returns that we receive from landfill operators. It's very similar. Um, so, in a sense, that, and that might explain the sort of background. In terms of where we're at, in terms of specifying what we need there, we're at the early stages. We've got an established relationship with the supplier because it's our current supplier. So we don't need to go through a procurement process specifically for this. Um, there's provision within the existing contract to enable this module to be developed. So that 
means that we don't have the time scales associated with procurement. Um, and in terms of the actual specifics, we've started our process mapping work now. We've got a business analyst working with us who's working that through. Um, and we will be working with the um, uh, developer uh, over the summer with a view to us having a system that we can test late autumn. Um, in terms of, and Neil might want to come in and add some more detail, in terms of um, how, how, how much notice do we need? Um, part of the beauty of the system that we've got is that we have quite a lot of flexibility in there. So um, if bands change or rates change, that doesn't cause us a huge amount of difficulty in terms of design. What would, what would create more difficulty for us, and we're not anticipating this, but what would create more difficulty for us would be if the fundamental framework that the tax is based on altered, because clearly we are operating on the assumptions about what's in the policy memorandum and what government's you know, publicly stated intentions are for the broad framework of the tax. I don't know if, Neil, if you want to say anything in addition to that. Say a little bit more. I mean, the, <coughs> the business requirements, as Elaine said, are, are being uh, dealt with just now. Uh, we have a workshop with aircraft operators tomorrow um, to go through some of that and, and look at the sort of early screenshots of how the system might look and, and get some user feedback on the sort of early development of the system. Um, ultimately, we're looking to prepare the functional specification for the, the IT system um, through the course of March um, and April, and then that would lead to a work order request around about May time to start the building of the actual system and then again taking the collaborative approach that we've done in the past with the previous devolved taxes uh, we want to involve aircraft operators again as users of the system to do some user testing um, and get their feedback on on that um, so in, in terms of the cost though i think the reason that it appears low is because we're not building the platform as elaine said it's, it's uh, we're built we're adding something to an existing platform the existing platform already deals with user accounts, it deals with security measures and so on. Um, so we're not, we're not building a system from scratch here, we're not do doing a completely bespoke system, which is why it looks perhaps lower than it might otherwise have done. So mm -hmm. it takes some of the risk out of it as well. And if I could all, just one minor note, sorry, right. sorry, but one, one other point, and that is we of course, uh, I mentioned the experience we have with introducing the additional dwelling supplement. So in terms of how much this will cost, we've got a good benchmark there. And um, it's fair to say we've also built in a reasonable contingency into the 120. So as it stands at the moment, we're, we, we're not expecting to require all of that funding. OK. Just on the transaction numbers that the convener mentioned there, it's likely to be significantly higher, I think, in this in ADT than it perhaps is with the land and buildings transaction tax and other, in terms of the number of transactions that you'll be entitled to take tax from in terms of individual tax payment or is that, is that no, the case? No, we're expecting it to be much less than LBTT because the, the, the taxpayer will be the aircraft operator. Okay. And it's so it's so so it's the it's the it's the aircraft or the airline uh, it's the aircraft okay. operator who has the responsibility to submit the tax return. Mm -hmm. And so the obligation on them is to collect the data of their passenger limit. numbers and break it down okay. to, to the relevant um, bands and okay. apply the rates and make the return. So what we will get from them will be a, a, an aggregate return, okay. if you like. Okay. And the, the, the powers that we will have will be to drill into that and seek background data from them to test their compliance with the legislation. Okay. So it's a small number of returns in, in relation to LBTT. Right. And we're confident we can do it within the, the budget that you've... If highlighted. Thank you. With their departure tax, we're expecting um, returns to be in the order of under 500 per quarter, as opposed to LBTT, where we get around 10,000 per month. Right. So it's really quite a, a different scale altogether from LBTT and much more akin, as Elaine said, to Scottish landfill tax. So we're applying quite a lot of the learning that we've gone through over the years with Scottish landfill tax to how we're going to deliver your departure tax, just because it's similar in scope and complexity. Okay. So Thank you. Helpful. Ivan, you've got a supplementary. I saw you trying to get. Just to drill a wee bit further down until you talked about the um, the readiness of the system and the way you've designed that and what it can cope with and what 
perhaps couldn't cope with. And I suppose I'm just coming out from a, 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 an overview that says that the purpose, obviously, of the, the policy is to uh, stimulate economic growth. So it may be that when we look at it from a policy point of view, we come to some conclusions that say there might need to be many more bans, there might need to be differentiation between types of passengers, there might be differentiation between time of the week or time of the year. There could be a whole lot of different things, depending on how this the, the policy discussion goes, that, that enable it to focus down on specifics to stimulate growth for certain businesses in certain areas, for certain distinguished perhaps between outbound tourism and inbound tourism. There's a whole number of variables. So I suppose the question is, at what point does what you've designed kind of start to not be fit for purpose if the policy does go in those kind of more complex directions? The advice that um, I have from, from, from my team working on this <clears throat> is, is so long as um, uh, the fundamental structure of rates and bans is there, it doesn't really, it's not that it doesn't matter, but obviously we can accommodate a number of rates, we can accommodate a, sure. a number of bans. Um, a more complex system, a more sort of sophisticated um, mm -hmm. system uh, such as you're describing actually places a, 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 a potentially a bigger burden on the aircraft operator because sure, yeah. ultimately what we will be getting in will be the aggregate return against right. all those different categories. Mm -hmm. So we can design a tax return which has the fields required. Right. Um, it's The obligation well, would be on the aircraft operator to have their systems sure. and processes uh, amended to be able to provide us with that information. Okay, so it would really be them rather than you that would, that would find most of the... I think the so. difficulty there. I would expect so. I mean, okay. as Elaine says, we can design the tax return. I think the key thing is, is if it's on a per passenger basis, on the basis of tax bans, as we've got at the moment, um, our system, and we've done the same with the first two devolved taxes as well, our system has to be flexible enough to accommodate changes of rates, changes of bans, additional bans, removal of bans, and we can handle all of that. Um, it's where the, the entire structure of the tax has changed. If we, if we didn't do a per passenger, tax on the basis of tax bans as it's set out in the policy memorandum. That's that's our assumption at the moment mm. and that's the way the tax the tax will be structured and framed. But it could be something around about type of passenger, for example. Yeah, I mean it, it depends on the variables sure. to be honest. Yeah, but but I mean, yeah, we can okay. we can build variables, but as Elaine said, the more the more variables you add into the, the mix, the more complicated it then becomes for airlines in particular. So it might be that the airlines need more time uh, or or have to deal with that complexity. Okay. Ultimately, they will be filling in a tax return that we will have online as a form. Okay. And but that complexity comes that's, earlier that's in the clear. process. I, I suppose just a quick follow up to that, you kind of hinted on it earlier. Um, auditability, because at the end of the day, all you'll get is a, something from the airline that says we owe you a million pounds. And then what's the process whereby you go, you're able to go back and drill into their passenger numbers and their records, etc. Yeah. And how often do you expect to be doing that to um, to ensure that you're getting the correct information on the return? Well, we, <coughs> part of the, the uh, team that um, will be uh, established within Revenue Scotland uh, for having responsibility for the management of this tax, part of their role will be to do, that's what we would class as compliance work. Um, and we will be designing our, um, if I can call it, strategy for compliance for this particular tax um, over the next year. Um, so we, have, we will have powers under the legislation in the same ways we have for our other um, taxes to uh, open inquiries, to require the tax payer to provide us with information. Uh, we will have powers to uh, drill into that information, to go and visit them in their premises. Um, so, you know, we will we will have powers to get to get the information we need. We will also uh, be uh, able to access other information not held by the taxpayers to check against. So we can we can work with the Civil Aviation Authority, for example, to look at passenger numbers, passenger flows, because they will have that information too, and match that against what we are seeing in terms of the data that comes from the aircraft operator. Um, we will also uh, have, as we have with our other taxes, we will have um, uh, information sharing agreements and MOUs with HMRC. So we will able to, our compliance work will also enable us to access data that HMRC might have that would also help check against what the aircraft operator is submitting by way of a return. So in a sense, the, the approach that we would take for this tax is pretty similar to the approach that we would take for other taxes. Okay. Okay, that's great. Thank you. Thanks.
Liam, are you still got some areas that you want to... Uh, no, that's fine, actually. I wondered if problem. most of it's been covered. Mm -hmm. uh, in that case, Marie, you, your issues on timing. Um. Yeah, um, good morning. Just good morning. Uh, I have a slight concern. It might be me that's unable to understand it, an issue around timetabling. So um, the airlines are telling us that this tax needs, the, the bans and rates need to be um, published or public before about a year, a year and a half before... Um, it's introduced in order that they can charge it. I, is that going to be an issue in terms of collecting? Is that going to add a complexity to the, to the system if it's, not if, you, if it's not made public until a short time before it happens? The re I, I suspect the reason that the airlines or the aircraft operators would be making that point to the committee would be because they'd be thinking about it from the perspective of planning their business and what they would be charging passengers. Um, from our perspective, um, we can, we can, um, we, it, it doesn't really impact on us, um, that issue, um, because we will be requiring them to provide us with uh, tax returns for their first quarter of business starting from 1st of April next year through to July. So the first tax return they would need to send to us would be summer next year, and that would only cover the um, uh, a flights um, which they have operated um, from the 1st of April departing from Scotland. So there has also been the situation, as I understand it, in the past where um, HMRC have made changes, they've maybe introduced exemptions or, um, to the existing UK tax and they've introduced them from a, a date after, you know, w when the airline operator has already charged that mm -hmm. tax mm -hmm. because they've taken bookings prior. And our understanding from HMRC is the airlines have all been very cooperative in working with the bookings that they had taken right. and, and reimbursing. Not all of the airlines also, as I understand it, pass the tax on okay. directly to the passenger. So, so their issue with, with, with timing is to do with their ability to, to, to plan to the their business. <laughs> yes, well, <laughs> okay. to plan Thank their you. business. Thank you. Ready? Yep. Patrick. Thank you. The, just to, to follow up on the, the questions about implementation, first of all, um, I'm still a wee bit unclear how much flexibility you would be able to cope with uh, without there being a, a, an impact on your implementation of the tax. If, for example, uh, Parliament chose to take the bill in a different direction, if Parliament chose a different structure to the to the tax, if, if Parliament chose to change the uh, requirements in relation to fiscal representatives, if, if Parliament disagreed with the, the government on the question of monthly versus quarterly returns, how much change uh, would, would you think is, is tolerable without having a, an impact on implementation and are there particular changes that Parliament might consider that you would cons that you would think were problematic? There's a lot in that question. Um, actually, it, dep it, depends, it depends what the changes are. Mm. Um, so, uh, if Parliament were to decide for, to take, for example, your example of moving from quarterly to monthly, we would be able to accommodate that. Um, if there are, it depends what the changes would be around fiscal representative. Um, I don't imagine, <clears throat> I can't you know, off the top of my head think of changes that would affect our, our ability to implement for the 1st of April. Um, the fundamental issue for us that might cause an issue for us is if the, the, the underlying structure of the tax changes, so if it moves away from being based on passenger numbers, on rates and bans. Um, but again, um, it, we would need to look at the detail of what Parliament was wanting to have changed and we would be able to provide Scottish Government and Parliament with advice around that in terms of the, the impact on us. Um, ultimately, that... what we need is, a, is the ability to get a tax return in mm -hmm. with the data that, that enables us to be able to check that the right amount of tax has been paid. I think if there's fundamental changes to the structure of the tax, as we said before, it might give us issues with our IT. It would depend what, what the nature was. It's more the impact on the aircraft operators and on the airlines, because remember, they also have systems that they, because, because the obligation is on them is to hold the data and to be able to provide the data in a way that we're able to check that it's right. Mm. 
Okay. I, I also <coughs> just wanted to ask about um, the European Economic Area. There are yes. three references, I think, in your written submission to the European Economic Area, um, mostly in relation to uh, the appointment of fiscal representatives. Yes. But I was just uh, unclear <coughs> whether there was an implication in there that if we find ourselves outside the European Economic Area, there are consequences uh, which would be problematic. The issue that we wanted to bring to the attention of the committee about the fiscal representatives in the European Economic Area is that it's a change from the current UK system. Mm -hmm. And the reason that it's a change from the current UK system is because of this Parliament's obligations to um, respect um, um, European law in legislation that this Parliament passes. So um, what the, the, the change that we will experience um, as the legislation currently stands is that aircraft operators, rather than being obliged as they're able to, as HMRC are able to do at the moment, rather than being obliged to uh, have a fiscal representative within the UK, mm -hmm. so that HMRC only have to deal with fiscal representatives within the UK, what we will have to be ready to do is um, uh, deal with fiscal representatives located anywhere within the European Economic Area. So you could imagine from a compliance perspective or a debt recovery perspective, that could give us slightly more complexity than dealing with air, uh, with fiscal representatives based within the United Kingdom. Um, yeah, I mean, the, so the, the potential problems that you flagged up there are to do with language or, or communication or, or what have you. Or enforcement. Or <coughs> Yeah. But would our position outside the European economic area, if that comes about, would that exacerbate the potential problems around enforcement or collection uh, or uh, any other aspect of, of how the system is supposed to work? I, I, would, I would need to take legal advice on what the impact would be. Um, um, it may well be, it depends of course what happens with, with, uh, with um, Brexit, but it may well be that in the event um, that uh, we are outside of um, the European Union, that there could be changes made to this legislation to, uh, if you like, give us the opportunity to insist on a fiscal representative within the UK or within Scotland, rather than um, the airline operate, aircraft operators being able to have somebody based anywhere within the European economic area. But that's a legal question, and it's also it would be a policy question mm. at the time. Do you happen to know what the the kind of relevant situation is in in other countries within Europe in the broadest sense, but outside the EU? Uh, do they require a domestic representative for these kind of arrangements, I'm or are they able to operate uh, for this purpose within the EEA as a larger area? I, I'm afraid I don't know the okay. answer to that question. Not sure about that one. No. Okay. Thank you. It. it may be useful if you. If you could follow up on some of that, though, and just let us have a, a note, because obviously we'll have the, the minister next week, and we can ask him similar questions. Um, Liam, I think you had a question in this area as well. Yes, thank you, convener. It's just a, a very quick one, uh, a matter arising from something you mentioned, Ms. Lorimer, which was, and I appreciate this isn't entirely your area, but you said not all the airlines pass the tax on to their passengers. Are you able to elaborate on that? Just because we've obviously had a number of witnesses previously saying, look, if you cut the tax, then that cuts the cost to the consumer, therefore there'll be a, a modal shift. But if the airlines aren't passing the tax on in fares, then that might not happen. So I just wondered if you were able to elaborate on your statement. Um, my understanding is that um, there isn't any obligation on aircraft operators to pass the tax on. Mm -hmm. So it's a business decision that they are making to pass that tax on if that's what they're choosing to do. And that's do you have any oversight on how many, what proportion are currently passing on? I have no tax. information in relation to that, I'm sorry. All right, thank you. Can I just have a thought on Patrick's question around the fiscal compliance individual? If if the legislation currently is stating that that individual needs to be based within the EE area, do we, I think, in, in your response to this, could you consider whether or not then the legislation needs to be a bit more flexible in terms of the longer term, if for whatever reason we're outside the European Union and outside the EEA, 
I think just a reflection that would be helpful for us as well. I think. I think. <coughs> I think that's. Sorry. Or if we're still in it, and our nearest neighbour is well, still outside of it. Uh, indeed. Well, there's always lots, there's lots of potentials. <laughs> all I'm looking for is general flexibility in the, in the legislation. I, we, we, we will see what we can do in relation to that. I mean, I think that's that's obviously a legal point. It's also perhaps a policy point. So um, Scottish government would clearly need to have a view. But yes, we will. We'll see what we can do. I think the other thing um, uh, to say, though, is it's the way it's currently crafted is because of the way the law currently stands. Okay, understand that. Yeah. Can I just add one minor point? Sure. Uh, um, sorry, the, at the moment, the fiscal representatives for UK APD are to be based in the UK. Yeah, so the there is a, there's no obligation, but there's the possibility that any aircraft operator outside the UK with no, in the, the economic and area, European economic area, mm. that has no presence in the UK may choose to use their existing fiscal representative in the UK that they use for UK APD for the purposes of air departure tax, in which case we would we would still be dealing with someone based in the UK. Now, that's there's no obligation on them to do so, but there's a possibility that they might. So that would make things a bit easier. Yeah, I don't think it's too far, but you could yeah. just have a situation where you, the, the legislation here requires somebody who's based in Scotland, and that deals with everything, and that gives us ma maximum flexibility. But I'll leave you guys to come back and tell me that if you want to. <laughs> Ash. Good morning. So UK. APD obviously works on monthly returns, as you mentioned yes. earlier in a response to a question. But Revenue Scotland obviously wants to move to ADT um, being monthly data on quarterly returns. Um, but the CIOT, I don't know if you've seen their comments, they said that they felt that Revenue Scotland's arguments in this were not entirely valid. And they also had concerns around the fact that because landfill tax also is based on a quarterly return cycle, that this could create a bit of a workload pinch points if you were getting all the returns in at once. Would you like to speak to that? I'll answer the second bit of your question first, if I may. Um, and that is that a, uh, the way we are, we will be staffing um, uh, the organisation, the, the, the management and administration of the air departure tax returns when they come in will be dealt with in a separate team from the landfill tax team. The way in which we've been developing as an organisation is we, we recognise we absolutely have to be expert in the individual taxes that um, that we have and therefore um, we have different teams specialising in the different taxes. So um, from that very basic perspective there should not be a problem at all in terms of workflow. Uh, management here and we've already talked about the system's capacity so there shouldn't be a pinch point in terms of the system and there shouldn't be a pinch point in terms of our staffing. Um, okay. In terms of uh, moving <coughs> from um, monthly returns to quarterly returns, um, we uh, we think that um, this uh, actually uh, will benefit the airlines because obviously they're having to send, they still have to keep the data, but the, they're having to, the, they will only have to go through the process of compiling a tax return on a quarterly basis, so fewer occasions in the year. Um, uh, and we uh, shared our thinking about this with the aircraft operators, with the airlines early on in our engagement with them. and. Um, they have, they have, they have, ex they, they are supportive of this as a concept because it's one, it's, it's, a, it's less admin um, hassle for them. Um, so I think that I hope that answers your question. So from our perspective, that's the model that we've got for landfill tax. It works. Um, the airlines uh, so far have said to us that they think that this is a, a good positive move for them as well. Um, they'll still have to keep the monthly data, but they won't have to go through that admin process of collating all of that data and submitting it in a tax return on a monthly basis. Okay. Um, and second question is about the register. So um, is there any conflict between Revenue Scotland's powers um, in the Act on taxpayer confidentiality and the register? Um, will it be a list of operators or will it be a list of passengers? <coughs> um, uh, uh, as, you, as you know from our, from our uh, legislation, we have the obligation, we have an obligation to have a register. We have a register under uh, landfill tax for landfill operators. Um, we are very, very mindful of our uh, obligations under the Revenue Scotland Tax Powers Act in relation to protecting taxpayer information. And therefore, we would uh, absolutely not 
uh, wish to be put in a situation or indeed put any tax operator, uh, air, aircraft operator in a situation where we were breaching those obligations. And so our current thinking, we haven't finalised it yet, but our current thinking is that we would move to a similar model to what we have for landfill tax, and that would be that it is the name of the aircraft operator that would be on the register. It most certainly would not be uh, the individual passengers, not at all. It's the aircraft operator who is the taxpayer, and it's the aircraft operator that we are interested in. Okay, thank you. Okay. Neil, I think you have some questions in this area as well. Just very briefly, <coughs> I understand what you're saying about it would be, you know, this hassle for air, um, air, uh, airline operators to to do the um, the monthly returns or the quarterly returns on the monthly returns. Is there not an argument that it's better for the public purse to have regular monthly income as opposed to quarterly? Income? That's a question for Scottish government, okay. I think. I mean, obviously, right, obviously, but, but obviously, obviously, um, uh, Scottish. This is Scottish government's bill, so mm -hmm. um, they've obviously thought that through in terms of what they, what they have put in the bill. Okay, I'll ask them that. Okay, Adam. Thank you. I just want a couple of quick questions about staffing and um, estate and operating costs. Uh, what's the current staff of Revenue Scotland? Uh, we're around um, uh, 50, 55 staff at the moment. And, we'll and go up to about 60. Uh, well, that was going to be, are you going, to go up, uh, going up to about 60 because of the additional um, devolution of this tax? Um, yes. So you'll see from our um, uh, what was in the financial memorandum um, what we have um, sought in terms of additional staff costs to enable us to First of all, do the work this year uh, with building up a programme um, so that we can introduce the tax and then ongoing uh, costs in relation to putting a small team of professionals together to, to manage this tax um, for us. Thank you. And, 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 and what about estate provision? Do you need additional estate provision to house the additional staff? No, we don't. Um, we um, actually, just last weekend, uh, um, uh, moved to a different layout within our existing footprint in Victoria Quay, uh, which um, means that we can operate much more flexibly in the office. So we've got, we have got sufficient space within the office to accommodate new staff. Okay, thanks. And, and the operational, annual operational cost of Revenue Scotland will go up by about how much, do you think? Um, it's in the order of half a million pounds um, a year additional going forward, yes. Okay. Thanks very much. Okay, I, I thank witnesses for coming in this morning and giving us evidence. I think it was a very helpful session and I think it says to us you're well prepared, uh, or as well prepared as you can be in the circumstances of dealing with new taxation. So thank you very much. I now sus suspend the meeting to allow the change of our witnesses.
Okay, colleagues, um, we recommence. Um, our next piece of business is to continue our consideration of the air departure tax bill at stage one, and we're joined for our second panel witnesses by Mike Robinson, who's a board member of Stop Climate Chaos, and Chris Day, who's a policy advisor for Transform Scotland. I very much warmly welcome you to the evidence-taking session this morning. Thank you for Transform for providing us with some evidence beforehand. And we'll just kick straight off with and Maria Evans will ask you a question. Thank you, convener. Hi there. Um, I'm sure you're aware that I'm a representative for the Highlands and Islands, so I wanted to particularly focus on the um, lifeline nature of flights from the Highlands and Islands initially. Um, there was a number of representations made that said that not only should we maintain the uh, reduction in your um, in tax for flights out of the Highlands and Islands, but we should also um, consider abolishing it for the flights into the Highlands and Islands. And I just wondered what your thoughts were on that. Um, our, our view is, as you'll see from our evidence, is that there is a case for treating the um, the islands differently, in particular because um, <clears throat> there is an argument that. Um, there is no alternative for, for some types of journeys um, uh, to and from from the Highlands and Islands. I'm I'm not quite sure what the distinction really, in a way, is between an in and an uh, travelling in and out, in the sense that you're charged if if you know if, if you're charged APD or ADT on, on on one leg of the journey. I think that the upshot is that we're, we're, what we're saying is, as you'll see. A consistent theme throughout our evidence is that um, where there is a case for a different regime where there is clearly no alternative. Um, I don't want to get into an argument about what lifeline is because one person's luxury is another person's lifeline and vice versa. So that's quite a difficult one. I think what the Scottish Government would have to be careful to do, however, is to ensure that um, if traffic is generated on air services to and from the Highlands and Islands, it does not have, it does not undermine the ferry services, um, for reasons which I suspect would be fairly obvious. I'll, I'll go into if, if you wish, but I probably don't need to say more than that. Okay. I think. Sorry. I mean, I'll add. I mean, in terms of lifeline services, I don't think anybody's really questioning that, other than perhaps the issue of connected connected flights um, and the issue that you can. You're, you don't pay APD on ongoing flights that are well beyond, you know, and it's not just about coming back to the main cities in Scotland or something. You can fly all the way to New York if you book the ticket in the right place and not pay APD, and that doesn't seem to make sense to anybody. So um, I don't think we have an issue with lifeline services per se, but clearly that connectivity seems a little uh, wrong. OK, and I, I noticed that you specifically said island services. Do you have a different view for those um, mainland airports that might be... Uh, the question would be connectivity. I mean, the... the well, it depends how, how for, far for, into the highlands you're for going. For example, the Wick Airport, which would... The alternative is an eight-hour overland yeah. trip to Edinburgh. Um, well, I suppose our argument will be that we would like to see the Scottish Government investing in the railway network to reduce journey times between Wick and, um, and the Central Belt. Um, it, 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 uh, it, it, it's not a major issue for, from our point of view, but it's simply because the scale of travel that we're talking about is not... I mean, what our prime concern is is to do with the... Um, you know, the larger flows between the main the main airports, uh, Inverness and Aberdeen, um, rather than if you like, kind of, you know, flights which are typically catered for by small aircraft, which in any case, um, under the under the current proposals are exempt because quite frequently, although I believe not always, are uh, exempt because they're under a certain weight. Okay. On that, um, just picking up on something that you said there, you were talking about the, the overall number of flights. You know, it wasn't a huge, significant contribution, the number from the Highlands and Islands. People giving evidence before have said, basically, that, that the, the contribution for the number of flights in Scotland isn't a huge com 
contribution in terms of the world over. And if you look at um, any increase in flights to or from Scotland, that it should really be put in a world context. And actually, it's not extra flights that wouldn't have happened. It is simply extra flights to Scotland rather than some other international destination. I wonder if you have a response to that. Um, if I put it politely, I would say that seems as though what Scotland would be asking to be exempted from its obligations to the wider world. Um, there is an argument that is sometimes put forward that, well, why does Scotland bother with its climate change um, uh, plans given the scale of um, carbon emissions that are being exempt, uh, emitted by China or the United States? Um, I think the, the nature of the... Uh, I mean, this is perhaps Mike's area of expertise rather than mine. But the nature of the climate change emergency is such that, um, you know, that's not really a, a moral or sustainable argument to me. I mean, we, we are a relatively a, a, a well-developed, relatively wealthy country. And I don't think it's acceptable to be saying to other countries, well, you're more of a problem than we are. And so we would only make a small contribution. We, we are actually in a position where we have a much greater choice than many other countries in the world or much greater opportunity to, to, to make a difference in terms of, 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 of leading on climate change simply because of the, the relative wealth we have compared to, uh, I was going to say the Maldives, but that's perhaps not a good example, but you'll be able to think of other examples. And I, I mean, obviously, I t tend to concur with that. I think it's a spurious argument for a number of different reasons, but... Um, but also, it's, um, it's not actually helpful in the context of Scotland alone, because we have a set of targets and ambitions around climate change. And so we shouldn't be exempting one industry from any responsibility to help deliver on that. Um, I think that's quite a fundamental point here. The rest of society currently is aiming for an 80% reduction in carbon emissions by 2050. And we're watching one industry doubling its carbon impact and expecting to do so again by that period. And it has to play a role. Why is it being treated differently than every other industry out there? It seems actually anti-competitive apart from anything else. In terms of your question about um, flights into the Highlands and Islands as against out of, I think that's also an interesting question. It's maybe not necessarily purely an environmental question, but there seems to be some disagreement exactly about the entire purpose of, um, of a, this reduction in APD. Uh, I've sat on the forum since its inception, and it initially began as a way of increasing business connectivity, and that was very much its primary purpose. Um, if it's actually an economic stimulus, that's a slightly different thing, um, arguably because more people in this country fly abroad than fly here, we should be recognising that incentivising people coming here might actually help our economy, but incentivising people flying out helps someone else's economy. And maybe we need to think about that's just as true for the Highlands and Islands as it is for Scotland as a whole. So I think we've just got to be a little bit careful. We are trying to deliver um, against Scottish commitments on, on the climate, and we shouldn't be seeing this as a separate issue. OK. Um I guess the final point I would put to you, which has been put very loudly and clearly by the many um, people that we've seen, is that the, the, the view, I mean, Scotland is undoubtedly an island nation, or the UK is an island nation on the western periphery of Europe. The Highlands and Islands, which I represent, is very dependent on tourism. Um, we need people to come. Uh, we're ranked, Scotland is ranked about 140 out of 141 in terms of world holiday costs for the world and this particular tax is the second highest in the world so i guess what people giving evidence to us would say is not um that we can afford to do more but that we should level the playing field so that we compete evenly rather than um, gaining a competitive advantage and i wonder what you would say in response to that well, my view is several fold i suppose and it's just really my view. One is that um, any competitive advantage we might gain is debatable how long that's going to last and I'm interested to know how um, we are going to ensure that um, airlines hold to any commitments they might make um, for any real length of time because if we're trying to do this for that, that benefit then as soon as that benefit diminishes are they going to just up sticks and move on? 
So I think there are some issues there around the longevity of this as a, as a measure. Um, and I think that's something we need to sort of bear in mind. So. Um, yes. Uh, I mean, it's useful to kind of bear in mind how much, what, what the cost of, of, of ABT and ADT is to, to the inbound traveller. I mean, the typical figure um, is is thirteen pounds, which in the co in the context of a holiday uh, for four um, is, is 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 not is is not an awful lot. I would have thought the argument might well be that if you are intending to give a break of to the value of one hundred and eighty million pounds, um, which is designed to bring down costs, then you might as well give that directly to the tourist industry to reduce its costs on site, for argument's sake, um, rather than doing it indirectly by giving, if you like, a, a kind of third party, a reduction in costs. I mean, I suspect what we will see in terms of people's travel decisions, certainly within the next year, is that any change that results, that was, was to result from a change in air departure tax is going to be swamped by the fact the value of the pounds declined. You know, that's what decides, is, is critical in people deciding where they're going to go on holiday. And in, even the Civil Aviation Authority reported that there are many factors affecting, I mean, there are just a huge number of factors affecting the cost of a holiday. So there's far more than just the flight, if it happens that you come by, by plane, although of course most of our tourists don't, most of our tourists come by land. So, first of all, it's not actually catering to most of our tourists anyway. But secondly, actually, it's a fairly minimal part of the overall cost of flying. And even the CAA said that actually the cost of fuel and all sorts of other factors, including things like security in the state of the economy, have a far greater impact than what you may or may not do in terms of tweaking APD. So. Okay, thank you. Well, listen, I've just got to follow through on that bit, because if, if we take through the logic that the, the, the impact of the change of the pound is going to be so significant, and I'm not saying it's not going to be, what you're really saying in that circumstance, it doesn't really matter what this level of taxation is. Um, well, if, if you were to, if you were to pose, impose a, take one yeah, uh, uh, logical absurdity of, of, of a tax of a, a thousand pounds, what that may well do. Yeah. But I think the scale of what you know, the scale of what the tax is, is now is 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 that it's insignificant in the context of the other other costs of holiday. I think that's borne out also by the evidence that was given by um, all the evidence that, that's included in the um, reports that have been done, for example, for Edinburgh Airport and I believe for the Scottish Government, which indicated that actually, uh, certainly for the business sector, um, I'm trying to avoid transport jargon here because it talks in terms of elasticities, but actually... Um, the, I can never remember whether it's, it's demand is elastic or inelastic, but actually, it's that the cost of the the, the cost of, of the taxes is a fairly small part of um, a decision about whether to travel or not. That is buried in there in the Edinburgh Airport report, and also I think in the note that um, I think footnote three, the Transport Scotland's estimate of the impact of emissions of a reduction in APD in Scotland. Liam. Thank you. Uh, just to, first of all, to <coughs> excuse me, go back. Uh, you mentioned about the ferry services. You, you, you seem to imply, Mr. Day, that there was a. Uh, if we drove traffic to air from ferry services, that would be a bad thing, and that that was obvious why that was a bad thing. Uh, forgive me, I. I don't know why it is obvious. Uh, would you mind elaborating on that? Well, because ultimately it would undermine the viability of the ferry services, which may well incur further cost to the Scottish Government. I presume, uh, I mean, I am a Central Belt resident, uh, so um, I must admit my knowledge of the islands and islands is, is limited, but I, I would assume that it is important for the islands and islands that ferry services continue to be available uh, at a at least at a level of service that uh, meets their needs. Uh, if they are not carrying passengers because everybody's travelling by air, then ultimately, eventually, a question is going to arise. 
I, I just find that quite interesting because I, effectively you're talking about, as I understand it, both of you gentlemen are here with uh, almost an environmental hat on a concern mm -hmm. about the environment. And of course, uh, just running your argument through, uh, I would have thought you'd approach it as which is the least environmentally damaging mode of transport. Yep. Uh, so have you done any analysis on, uh, from that perspective, whether you would prefer to drive a modal shift from ferries to air, for example? I think generally speaking, it's the case that sea travel tends to be, I mean, this is a, a, a generalisation, but generally speaking, sea travel is um, more, um, produces less emissions and consumes less energy per passenger at, or passenger kilometre than uh, air travel does. Right. Uh, have you got... Uh actual modelling that says that. I'm just thinking, so so I would be up in the northeast of Scotland, yep. and if I want to go up to the Northern Isles, for example, then I might choose to drive mm -hmm. to Thurzo uh, yep. and take the ferry there, and so that there's actually a huge uh, extra environmental burden, if I can put it that way, if I make that choice yeah. uh, over air, isn't there? There's a lot of statistics out there for this, and I mean, I don't have them to hand, but there's lots of these sorts of things at passenger kilometre consumption of, uh, of carbon. They vary enormously because there's so many factors and it depends how many people are in your car, how many, how, what the capacity is, how many passengers there are and all of those different issues. So we, it's actually very difficult to get into absolute detail and I'm sure you could come up with an example which would look worse than another. But the fundamental principle doesn't change and that is as a general rule flying is more expensive per passenger kilometre than any other form of transport. That's especially true of, I mean, one of the issues I think that has actually come up in the, in the forum is the issue of short haul over long haul because um, you, you actually, part of the energy consumption is in the taking off. That's much more uh, energy consumptive. So obviously over the long, a, a short haul flight per passenger kilometre is the worst of all. Having said that, obviously it's, there's also a factor and it's in the Climate Change Act um, that there's a recognition that aviation has a much higher uh, impact uh, as well because of where the emissions take place. Uh, and there is actually a multiplier in the Climate Change Act, Scotland, albeit it's currently set at one, um, which is somewhat farcical. But at the end of the day, there's a recognition there that aviation has a, an added factor beyond just its pure fuel consumption. If you were driving to a ferry terminal, you may well also need to drive to an airport. So, yes, I, I accept that, but well, I, I don't want to develop the argument because I think okay. that's quite a facile analysis, if I may say so. Uh, taking at face value that consumers are choosing rail over air, I, so you, you talk, so I'm addressing this to Mr Day just because I've got your report here, um, they're choosing rail over air because they, are, they have a difficulty with the £7 charge. Uh, the, the air passenger duty. What modelling has been done showing that if you remove or reduce the air passenger duty, that there will be such a detriment to cross-border rail travel? Well, I'm aware that you've had evidence from Virgin Trains which indicates a very significant impact on their um, London to Edinburgh figures. Um, of course, we're not just talking about Virgin trains there are I think a total of four um, different operators providing Anglo-Scottish services although uh, two of those franchises are, is, is operated by, 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 by the one. Um, I, other than that I wouldn't kind of quote any specific modelling. Um, you can look at general trends that where a low cost um, air operation comes into a, into effect, then it has an impact on um, equivalent rail journeys. I believe and vice versa. Sorry, yeah. I, sorry, I was going to say, um, I believe there is a study that says that when the APD was introduced, there was a 3% uplift in train usage on those areas where there was a, where, where that alternative existed. Mm -hmm. Now, there's not, I don't think there's any evidence, I don't know if anybody's modelled what the impact of that done the other way around would be, but clearly the train lines have, the, the, the rail companies have a, a concern, um, mm -hmm. and fairly obviously it's, they, they view it as anti-competitive. I just think we, we need that level of detail 
somebody needs to be doing that exercise because at the moment, so I'm looking at, for example, understand cross country are about to cut a service or a number of services from Aberdeen to Penzance because people simply aren't making that choice. And that's got nothing to do with their passenger duty or ADT uh, and everything to do with the mode that they wish to take the journey. So someone needs to be providing that data if we're to make a, a decision, it seems to me. Uh, Sorry, I would respond to that quickly. Yeah, please do. I, I totally agree. I think that actually throughout this entire process there's a lack of data, yeah. um, a lack of supportive data in a whole number of areas. And in fact, one of the things that we would ask for very strongly is that there's actually baselining done around this on a whole number of factors right now. Because if there, there's also talk of obviously the, it's the 50% cut and then another 50 if economic circumstances allow. I would actually say that that isn't enough. It should be if all sorts of factors and evidence are gathered that prove that this actually had the impact it set out to have because I'm, I'm not convinced by its economic case or its environmental case. And I think that actually there's clearly a need to see better baseline information for any decision to be made. Yeah. Uh, final thing again, Mr. Day, sorry, just because you've got your report here, I'm interested in it. Um, again, I'm going to take a, a very northeast view on this. Uh, it's something that you, you alluded to earlier on. Uh, when you talk about uh, a further tax reduction for aviation would encourage passengers to travel by plane and undermines the case for High Speed 2 coming up to Scotland. Uh, are you able to comment on, effectively, you're asking the people in the North East who realistically have no other means of getting to the South East, uh, if, they're, if they're business, they need to get down there very quickly, for example. I've seen trains in the North East, I'm sure I have. Why should people in the North East subsidise, effectively, a fast rail link to England from the central belt and still be expected to pay ADT for their journeys that they pretty much have to take by air? Um, my understanding of the Scottish Government's intentions in respect of HS2 is that... Um, <coughs> It will, it's, it will seek to negotiate an arrangement with the government in Westminster that protects slots to airports in the southeast um, because the regional transport partnerships in the northeast have said that they're quite content with the concept of HS2 as a general benefit of Anglo services on HS2 as a general benefit to Scotland. Um, but, you know, to pick up on, you know, to, uh, I suppose essentially the point you're making, uh, that in order for those, uh, if you like, the quid pro quo is that they ensure that slots are maintained at airports in the southeast for uh, journeys from Aberdeen and Inverness in particular. Mm -hmm. Patrick. Thanks very much, convener. Um can I just uh, reassure Mr Kerr, first of all, that he would need to be coal rolling in order for the road element of his journey to be more damaging than, uh, than the, the air element. Um, I, I'd like to, to move on to the wider uh, policy context and how this, uh, this bill fits into that, because obviously even the critics uh, of, the, of the bill and the government's policy are not arguing against uh, mixed modal provision uh, to the islands. Uh, that's, that's not something that, that is, is really being proposed by anyone, I think. Um, do you think the Scottish Government has a policy about aviation emission levels? How much they can be allowed to grow by or how much they should be limited by? I can't find one anywhere. Are you aware of a, a Scottish Government policy statement about that? I've never seen anything like that, no. But, um, and I know I would, from the assumption of... I mean, the, the point of this is... It's slightly responding to the last question as well, actually. This, is, this wasn't set out to be an environmental tax, of course. It, is a, it, it was a tax because people like the IMF and the World Bank said this industry was undertaxed. Yeah. But it has ended up being potentially an environmental tax, you'd like to think, because perhaps it has inhibited the growth of demand of aviation. But actually, aviation has not been diminished. It's actually at record levels, as you will have found out, I'm sure, from particularly Glasgow and Edinburgh airports. And therefore... It isn't actually particularly inhibiting demand as it's currently set out. Yes, the, the airports certainly say they're having a whale of a time and they're, they're growing massively. Um, the, the government's um, climate action plan, uh, the one thing it says about aviation, it says we might expect to see a 15% improvement in the efficiency of new aircraft by 2035. 
Now, even assuming uh, that all of the aircraft fleet is those super-efficient new aircraft, which I think is, is a, a, an ambitious assumption, uh, would it be fair to say that if we return to uh, the, the level of growth in aviation that we've seen over recent decades uh, between now and 25, uh, 2035, we would still be more than doubling the emissions from aviation? The, the forecast I've seen from Civil Aviation Authority suggests that we would be doubled by, uh, again, we've already doubled since 1990, and they would be doubled again by 2050. So yes, the demand is clearly expected to grow very substantially. And in, in your experience on the, the, the group that was working with the Scottish Government on, on this, uh, its, its policy, was there anyone seriously questioning the idea that having APD or the equivalent tax uh, would lead to the level of emission increase that the Scottish Government itself has predicted? Uh, obviously, the, the forum itself is primarily made up of airlines and um, travel bodies, so clearly there, there, there is a little bit of a, um, a, an interest in seeing a cut take place. But th I don't think anybody's questioning that aviation... I mean, nobody's, it's not been a f specific topic within the forum, as you might expect. Um, and I don't think there's any question about the impact of aviation on climate emissions. I mean, the Tyndall Centre reported that actually aviation would account for the entire emissions budget of the UK by 2050 if we allow it to continue to grow at the current rate. So clearly it isn't sustainable. I don't think anybody's questioning that. And so looking at the, the lack of any acknowledgement of these issues, either in the Scottish Government's Climate Action Plan that was published in January uh, or the, uh, the, the specific transport sector paper that accompanied it, uh, which has one mention of the word plane and actually no uh, uh, analysis about the, the, the environmental impacts of, of aviation. Given the, the, the lack of that kind of context, what changes would you be looking for to the bill that would require the Scottish Government to consider those issues properly in the, the setting of, of rates uh, and bans? Uh, you know, just remembering that the that the policy seems to have been decided before the strategic environmental assessment, which is the opposite of what the, the law is supposed to require. Well, not surprisingly, we would, we, I mean, we support the devolution of the, uh, the, the measure, but we do not want to see a cut to APD. We think it should be held at its current levels. Um, it's actually, there is some debate about different types of taxes that could be brought forwards, and there's certainly been a debate of that within the forum about having frequent flyer taxes and other types of measures. But they're incredibly complex mm -hmm. and difficult things to administer and very expensive to, to in, enforce. So actually, the fact that every time you fly, you pay is about as equitable as it gets. Mm. Fundamentally, I think we've said we don't view this as environmentally equitable um, because one industry is not being asked to do what every other industry is being asked to do. And actually, I think that's probably true economically and tax wise as well. But environmentally, um, yes, we've... I mean, the fact that the multiplier in the Act of 2009 is set at one is probably a fairly good indication of how we're treating aviation as opposed to every other industry. I'm, I'm just trying to get to specific changes that could make this bill better, because obviously we, Parliament has to pass something, whether this bill or another bill, uh, otherwise the, there's no provision to collect uh, APD under the, the, once it's devolved. Uh, so there has to be some legislation. Sorry. What is it that we can do with this bill that would lock in requirements for the government uh, either to report on the, the level of emissions that it thinks necessary or to uh, give a, 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 an undertaking as to the additional measures the rest of the economy is going to have to take to pull the extra weight that aviation is refusing to pull? Uh, for me, I guess the, the only easy answer is that it's more evidence-based and that, there, as I've sort of referred to in the previous um, question, I think that there needs to be a much sounder evidence base, both in terms of its economic and environmental impacts, but particularly its environmental impacts. And that, that should form the basis of any decision-making. So it shouldn't, for me, that should be a trigger to a decision being allowed or not allowed. Anything to add? Um, the, the bill, as it stands, is... is seems to me to be essentially a piece of enabling legislation. Um, uh, uh, what, what, what's, what's clearly important is the nature of the tax and the bans that's applied to it. I mean, we do make a, um, a reference in our evidence to the point that it's not quite clear how that, those will be subject to parliamentary scrutiny, which seems a bit odd. Um, but um, that, that's not necessarily kind of a... I wouldn't make anything beyond that.
Okay, thank you. Can I just, just, just for the record, to be absolute clarity, um, I just want to understand, do you support the general principles of the bill? Is it currently the, is it the general principles? Because otherwise, there will be no legal basis for collection of tax. Just, from, just for the record purposes... So We're entirely some... content with the uh, air, air passenger duty being uh, devolved to Scotland. And no, the question is, it... I asked was, do you support the general principles of the bill or do you not? Yes. Right. Mike, you, can you give us an answer on Same. that? Right, okay. Just so, for the record purposes, so we know where we are in terms of the bill itself. Um, with that said, Murdo. Okay. Uh, thank you, Commissioner. Good morning. Um, I think we understand from what you've said so far, obviously you're not uh, keen on a cut near passenger duty at all, and we get that because of your concerns about emissions from aviation. It's also a lot, Mr Day, in your submission about uh, the impacts on surface travel and concerns about modal shift away from rail, which reflects the evidence we heard a few weeks ago from Virgin Trains. I mean, given that we understand you don't like any cut in APD, do you have any view on whether, um, in terms of the balance between domestic, short haul and long haul, if there were to be a cut, is there, is, do you have any preference as to how that might be targeted? Uh, one could <laughs> We, I think at this stage we've got into the, the, the level of highlighting problems with the proposals that has been set out by the government so far. One can imagine there will be a multitude of ways in which, uh, I mean, the government's objective appears to be to reduce the burden of tax by 50%. Yeah. Now, um, I, I understand that generally interpreted as mean there would be 50% cut in the rate of APD across the board. There may be a number of different ways, tunes that you could play on that. Um, we are certainly, um, as I said in an earlier answer about that, the, 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 the islands, particularly concerned that, that, that where there is an alternative means of transport which is sustainable, that that uh, it seems bizarre to uh, enable a less to reduce the to provide a tax price to 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 a less sustainable form of transport so if I, can i draw from that therefore if, if the government was determined to press ahead with cutting your passenger duty by 50 percent in the generality would you view it as better for the environment if that cut was not on domestic and short haul and therefore weighted towards long haul um well uh my that would say, I mean, long haul flights are particularly kind of emissions heavy. Um, I think I think we would focus in the first stage at looking at where there is an alternative to, ins to ensuring that there are alternatives. Okay. But that as, might, as, as a I think qualified you, yes, I think yeah, to my question. Yes, you, your preface also <laughs> said, you know, we, we 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 don't want to see a cut at all because uh, yeah, no, I understand we, that. Yeah. yeah. Okay. okay, Mr. Robinson, do you have anything you want to add? Short haul is worse per passenger kilometre than long haul, but long haul is the bulk of the emissions because the distance is travelled. Um, I think ultimately, going back to the purpose of the bill, if it's about business connectivity, this is a very, very clumsy tool to bring that about. Okay. All right. Thank you. Hey, Willie? Thanks very much. Yeah. Um, in the previous committee, we heard some evidence that um, for the economic spin off for regional airports was, was significant in Ireland, where the tax was abolished. Some years ago, and as a, an Ayrshire MSP, I'm interested in doing what I can to support and promote Presswick Airport, uh, to encourage both tourists to come into Scotland and so on and so forth. Do you, is, you, is your view that it will have no noticeable impact in the economy of Ayrshire if we reduce the, the tax by 50% and, and expect, as we see, the numbers of passengers coming into that airport to rise significantly? Um. I suppose, yeah, well, I'm not quite sure whether you would be assuming that, that, that any benefit was accrued to Prestwick as opposed to Glasgow. Um, I think it's quite difficult to identify impacts on specific airports, particularly where there are a number of airports in close proximity, such as Prestwick and Glasgow. I mean, the fundamental view we take is that... Um, the economic growth of Scotland or anywhere else um, is led primarily by other factors than connectivity and then what tends to happen in terms of the growth or otherwise of air travel 
is that it follows economic growth. It doesn't lead it. And in fact, since um, uh, since submitting our evidence, I've, I've, I've produced a graph, which I'd be happy to circulate to the committee later, which indicates that when APD was introduced and doubled, um, there was practically no change to the uh, trends of air travel uh, at Heathrow and, and Edinburgh. So, you know, the point is that, um, you know, that, that, that that's not quite significant. Picking up the Irish example, and I'm aware that other evidence has been given to you at various times about this. Um, I mean, Belfast International's quoted um, that the APD rate at Belfast was reduced to 0% in 2011 because Continental Airlines, as was, threatened to withdraw its um, Newark Belfast journey and that was regarded as being particularly important. Um, that service no longer operates. Continental was taken over by United but they withdrew it because passenger numbers, even with the 0% uh, APD um, rate that was applied to it, um, Went, went, went down the tubes. And Ireland's kind of mentioned again, um, I've looked at figures for the three major airports in, in Ireland, which are Cork, Shannon and Dublin. And it is quite clear that what happened, what is happening is, if you recall, I mean, the, 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 the economy of Ireland was particularly badly affected during the, um, during the kind of latter part of the last decade. And that what you see is passenger numbers dropping um, throughout that period, are actually beginning to level off and return to a form of stability, though an upward, slight upward trend, before Ireland abolished APD. Now, Dublin's actually quite different. I mean, Cork and Shannon are still evidently struggling along quite a bit. But Dublin seems to follow quite a different trend, um, in fact, from much of the rest of the European airports as well, where you tend to see a rise up until about 2009, 2010, then a big drop and then a kind of grad gradual rise. And that applies across Europe. Um, but the du <laughs> Dublin, um, whether there's some kind of interaction between, with, with Cork and Shannon, I don't know. But, but Dublin seems to follow quite a different kind of projectile. But what's pr projection? But what's noticeable about Dublin is that, in fact, the upturn in flights at Dublin was in hand before Ireland abolished APD. That might not answer your question. <laughs> um, I think your question is very hard. Really to, you. yeah. your, your question is very hard to answer in a way. Um, I, for your sake, I hope Prestwick maybe does get a bit more business, but. Mm -hmm. um, it's, I don't know that. I think the question you should be asking is more of the airlines to say what commitment they have to support Prestwick in light of an APD cut. Because to be honest, it's just cutting, uh, making a marginal reduction in the price of tickets across the whole of Scotland is it's very difficult to isolate at one particular airport and say it's going to help that one as opposed to another. Well, I can remember the chief exec of Ryanair, Michael O'Leary, saying clearly that if APD went altogether, you could double the passenger numbers coming through Presswick, and that's double the number of people that need to eat, to sleep in hotels, to, to hire cars. I mean, that, that's surely bound to have a positive impact in the, the Ayrshire economy, you would imagine. I would like to think it would, but again, I would just say that the evidence is according to the CAA and ONS that far more people fly out rather than in. So, um, yes, I mean, it may well bring tourists to that area, but it may equally take twice as many locals away. A lot of these airlines are very mobile as well. I mean, they, they, they will introduce flights and you know for one season and then, then drop them. So um, I would be a wee bit sceptical about um, statements that are made by um, about long, long, the long-term investment in any local economy by an airline. Good. Thank you. Ivan? Thanks, uh, thanks, convener. Thanks uh, for coming along today, panel. Um, I'd like to—I know that you, you, you've got. Um, there's been a lot of discussion around the environmental impact. I'd like to just focus my questions on the economic impact, if that's okay. Um, and it was really just to um, get a view from you as to um, how that economic case stacks up. And I know you've made some some uh, some comments on that already, because clearly the whole point of the, the, any reduction in this tax going forward would be 
has been stated to generate economic activity and business connectivity, as you've talked about. Um, and there's clearly a number of ways to do that. And I know you've had some questions earlier from, from Murdo Fraser about, um, about how you would best see that applied. So I suppose the question is just to get your, if you want to make some comments around about, um, clearly Scotland needs to grow its economy and this is seen as a way of doing that. Um, do you have evidence or, or are you aware of any evidence that says that um, any numbers have been done that say by, by making this cut in the, in the tax, it, it won't generate the return that, it, that, that, that is being proposed? Um, do you think there'd be value in doing that analysis? And also in terms of the segmentation of this, clearly we've talked about outbound tourism, inbound tourism, business connectivity, long haul, short haul, etc. From a purely business point of view, leaving aside the, the, you know, the, the environmental aspects that you've talked about already, from a business point of view, do you see um, differential impacts around about that segmentation? Is that something that you'd, you'd want to comment on? I mean, I'll try and answer that as best I can. Um, I think the short version is, do we believe the economic case? Absolutely not for, the, for a, a moment. Um, but so in, my question was, do you have data to support but, that assessment? But in terms of the data to support that, I mean, some of that is about these wider statistics in terms of uh, what, what impact that has um, on, on passenger numbers. It has, if you're looking at business connectivity again, there are reports um, on the price insensitivity of business travel because business people tend to need to be somewhere and pay what's going. They're much less price sensitive than other travellers. So in fact, although this is meant to be a measure to do with that business connectivity, in fact, it's, I think it's highly debatable whether that will actually have any great impact because of that reason alone, whereas it will probably have an impact much more on just people going on holiday and things, which was never really the intention behind this. So, We, we don't have the evidence. I mean, we are a fairly small organisation. Um, I mean, what, I, th I think what, what we've tried to do is to look at the evidence, that, if you like, the, 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 the contradictory evidence that's been support, supplied by um, those who've been arguing the case for reduction, and, and, and we've challenged that. And as I kind of touched on my previous answer, I think, um, you know, it's very difficult to kind of see, certainly at a, a kind of global Scotland-wide level, the evidence that says, if you do this, Scotland's economy is going to benefit. I mean, on a very simplistic level, the, the UK economy, compared to the rest of the Europe, of Europe, is going at, growing at something like 2%. Um, and yet, this we're told this is the only country that charges APD in Europe. So, you know, What's that about? As I say, I mean, I have a graph which kind of indicates that, that it, you know, that the air travel follows the economy. But what's also striking about the, the data that is, it has been supplied by the industry and by the Scottish Government is that it assumes that if you bring people into Scotland uh, by one mode of transport, that is, uh, if you like, a free gain. They don't seem to consider that there are other forms of, uh, of, 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 of economy related to the transport that might disbenefit. For, you know, there, there are claims made about the number of jobs that would be generated at airports, no questions asked about the number of jobs that might be lost um, by in long, even long-distance coaches or, mm -hmm. or on the railways. Yeah, and, and I appreciate all the points you're making. Yeah. Um, and but, but what I'm asking is, and I think I've, I've got the answer, at the moment the only analysis I think that we've seen is Edinburgh Airport analysis, which I yep. think came from Bigger originally. And, and as um, Mike says, I mean, I mean, there is a strong case for further independent uh, evidence gathering. It has to be independent, though, um, to fill in some of the gaps in the evidence. Um, yeah, because clearly yeah. The, the result you'll get will depend on the assumptions you make, and you're making lots of yeah. assumptions there. Um, yeah. It would be obviously help everybody's analysis of this to be able to see that mm -hmm. based on the assumptions that you make and can yeah. and, and support to say if we did this, this would be the impact. Yeah. Maybe this wouldn't be as much, or maybe this would be less, mm -hmm. or this would be more. But as far as you're aware, there isn't anything on that, and nobody's doing that at the moment. There, there, yeah. there may be, but I'm right. not aware of it. Right. Right. That's fine. But it Thank is you. a clumsy tool, and therefore yeah. any differentiation yeah. in the way that it's applied would probably be helpful. OK, um, thank you very much for coming along today for that evidence-taking session. Um, I now close this meeting of the France and Constitution Committee. <laughs>